Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, good people around the world. This is Blackout Chat, collaboration between myself, Lee Johnson, and Reverend Kai. This is the South African screen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Blackout Chat, let's just get together every Friday, two witches talking about witchcraft and magic and stuff. And today we are starting our study of the Cochrane Letters, which is going to be immensely fun. And uh, <clears throat> so I think we'll just get started straight away. Um, shall I read the preamble on the 1734 site? Uh, sure. So we've got two websites to share with you. Uh, where you can find these letters. Uh, the first one here is the Clan of Tubal Cain site, and they have all of the letters and the articles, and they are here as facsimiles and PDF forms. And the facsimiles are kind of difficult to read in some cases. Uh, back in the days of Xeroxing, this is what we had. Then we've also got um, the letters on uh, Joseph Wilson's website, the 1734-witchcraft.org. And these letters are in text form. So that's what we're going to put on the screen, just for ease of reading. But we'll share both of the links uh, in the chat so that you can follow along however you'd like, whichever one you'd like to read. Yeah, so I'll put them in the chat, because um, I just put them in the description. Well, uh, down in the description is handy, too. They won't disappear yeah. like the chat does. Yeah, I think, I think go to the description, because for me to try and shift around now is not going to work. I can't get to the description now. All right. Uh, I was going to say, oh, the facsimiles themselves are actually good to, to look at because there are some illustrations and drawings uh, that he actually did, which did transpose over to the transcripts on the 1734 site, um, but they're just nice to look at, I think. Well, and they're a little more in context on the facsimiles, so it's, it's nice to have both for ease of reading, go back and forth between mm. them, especially if you're... You're going along in the facsimile and you find a word that you can't quite make out because, you know, the the typewriter didn't get the letter all the way in or the Xerox didn't work as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, check them both out. They're both very useful to have to have them and compare. All right. This, so this is just the Joseph Bear Walker Wilson. Let me try that again. Joseph Bear Walker Wilson letters. Uh, let me just read the preamble that he wrote here. Um, in early 1964, I had been working with Sean and what we called the Wichita group for about two years. It was then that I saw an advertisement from Pentagram and with his approval sent for and received it. Sean pointed out to me that the writings of Taliesin and Robert Cochran showed that their path was a first cousin of our own. I was quite excited at the concept of that four-page publication and immediately was inspired to start my own in the United States. I bought a spirit duplicator and began writing and printing The Waxing Moon, simply distributing, simply distributing it among the handful of people I knew in Wichita. In mid-1965, I decided to expand and late that year placed a classified advertisement in Fate magazine for my free witchcraft newsletter. I must point out here that Sean was quick to ask me why I was so stupid as to call it a witchcraft newsletter, since we didn't use that term. Throughout 1965, I wrote to, I wrote to, uh, I think I'm supposed to say I wrote several letters to Gerard Knoll, the publisher of Pentagram, and described some of the Wichita Group's spiritual activities. These included trips to the cave in Oklahoma, where two years earlier I had undergone my initiation in a manner sim similar to that described by Taliesin in his A Wood in the West Country article. I sent Gerard 
copies of the Waxing Moon as, a, as I published, published them, excuse me, then asked him to run a personal advertisement for me, requesting correspondence with those interested in the craft, describing my interests and also offering to send people a copy of the Waxing Moon in exchange for one shilling postage. Gerard published that personal published that personal uh, the advertisement sorry let me try that again Gerard published that personal in the fifth issue of Pentagram I was thrilled when Robert Cochran wrote to me these are the letters he wrote to me complete unedited and without comment <coughs> excuse me I'm just going to clear my throat for a second <coughs> um, there's actually quite a bit in there um, that it's actually mentioned the letters like not calling it witchcraft yeah, so 1734 um, is the tradition uh, founded, created, put together by Joseph Bear Walker which, uh, Wilson. And he sources three main strands for it, one of them being Cochran. So we're just looking at the letters uh, from Cochran to Wilson right now, and then later we'll look at the letters from Cochran to other people and their correspondence. Mm. But yeah, I've been to those That'd caves in Oklahoma. They're neat caves. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of a lot of uh, local witchcraft lore around Bear Walker here because, well, I live in Wichita, mm. and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the a lot of the um, landmarks and things that he discusses in 1734 and, and later in Tolteg are from right around here. So it's kind of neat. A bit of Very history. Very neat. You're right close by there. Yep. <clears throat> All right. So the first letter, 20 December 1965. Uh, shall I just read until you say stop or I feel stop? I'll yeah. just read. Yeah. Uh, dear Mr. Wilson. I read your advertisement in Pentagram with considerable interest, being somewhat interested and involved with the faith of the people. I have recently been delving into the symbolism of the Lee systems. Lay. And, oh, uh, Lay systems. Oh, I always said Lee systems. Anyway, Lay systems. And corresponding Herm posts. I don't know if that's supposed to be Hermy. I don't know. I've always said Hermy in my head because Hermes. And I just dropped yeah, the S. I'm not real I sure though. Because I, I went looking for Herm Herm E posts and there's nothing. Mm -mm. I can't find any information. I think that's a term um that Cochrane uses uh that is not widely used or he's using it to allude to something else. And that's mm. not what they're commonly called. I'm not really sure. I was wondering if it was supposed to be Hearn. Well, then they wouldn't be scattered throughout the Americas. And he says they are. And I mean, the ley line systems, they're, they're clearly all over the world, everywhere that humans have traveled. But mm. I'm really not sure what the Herm or Hermy posts are. I've never figured that out. Stones, yeah. maybe? Standing stones? But then he calls the Rollwright stones standing stones later, so. Yeah, well, I mean, you just refer to these as being altars at the at the point. Mm. Um, and also says that uh, he'll send pictures. This is in the second letter, everybody, by the way. Um, he'll send pictures of them so um, Wilson can identify them in America. So I don't know if you would call them Herm, Herm posts in America. I don't know. I don't know. It just says home. We're going to carry on with Herm. All right. Uh, let me start that paragraph again. I'll, I'll get through the whole thing then. Um, I have recently been delving into the symbolism of the Lee system, lay systems and co corresponding Herm or Hermie posts that are scattered throughout Europe and also America. I wonder if you have any knowledge of the Amarin system that was a marked part of the Sioux and which appears to have extended from Mass. I assume that's supposed to be Massachusetts. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. Throughout the Great Plains and into South America, 
I appear to have worded that somewhat badly. I meant the tradition of the lay path, not the actual system itself. The South American maze lays, it's a tongue twister, are of particular interest since they correspond very closely to part of the tradition that exists in Britain today, albeit the symbolism used is of a somewhat different origin. So when I first read that way, way back, I'm just going through and I thought maize in that sentence had an I in it and meant corn. Yeah. And I thought he was talking about corn labyrinths, which like doesn't have anything to do with ley lines and mm -hmm. ley systems. So I just thought that was, <laughs> and then like so many things, when you are studying so, so much, you're going along trying to pick up every little piece of information. Is there something you think, you know, you just assume that's what that is. And on you drive paying attention mm. to the mystery things. It wasn't until I went back and read it later that I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Why did you stick that in there as the <laughs> assumption of what was going on? Nope. <laughs> What would the maze lays be, though? I, I assume, I mean, the ley lines themselves, they don't really create a maze. No, I think he's talking about there are some, um, the notched ley paths in South America that were considered to be mazes as like labyrinth use of maze, but not labyrinth, that would span the continent. I don't know if those are still considered to be mazes because this is written in 1965 and a lot of things have changed. We have a lot more knowledge about the tracks and the, the traveling patterns and that sort of thing. I don't know. All, all, the, right. all the ley line stuff I've studied, uh, that book, The Old Straight Track, uh, which is like the best book there is on old ley lines and the walking paths. Um, that's all in Britain. Okay, we are now looking for the book <clears throat> by Alfred Watkins. Yeah, yeah. That's one of those uh, required reading for witches. Mm. Not really a book about magic, but, you know, very few of them are. Things magic. <clears throat> Just about the ley lines, that's that's uh, mm -hmm. the energy lines of the earth. So. But he doesn't talk yeah. about them as as mystical energy lines and, and that sort of thing. He talks about mm. them as, as navigating and walking over uh, the land and how these ley lines are not, they're a straight line, but they're not. Because when you think about how like water flows through a landscape and that sort of thing, are you better to go up the hill and then back down the hill? Or are you better to walk around the hill? And, mm. you know, line of sight is very important to help you navigate, uh, including navigation based on sun and stars. There's also this earth-based navigation system that early humans obviously put in place as a response and an interaction with their local landscape. And that's mm. the ley lines. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, um, I think it's. I think his main focus is actually the Hermi posts. Um, but we'll get to that in a second later. Let me not jump ahead. Okay, let me carry on. I understand from your advertisement that you are also interested in druidism. An interesting thing is that the original druids still appear to exist, since I am in contact with an old man born inside the Pale of the Faith, who claims hereditary knowledge of the druidical beliefs. And it appears that what he was taught as a child and young man, and what is claimed to be druidism by modern sects and historians, are two very different things. That's a whole topic we could actually discuss. <laughs> I mean, apparently my, my grandfather was a druid, but... I don't think there was anything mystical or magical about what he was practicing. Well, the term druidry or druidism is a, a huge umbrella term 
that means a variety of different things. It has settled down to mean more of a Celtic earth-based faith now, mm -hmm. but especially back in 1965 and earlier, it was a much broader term that applied to many, many different things. Um, it was almost used to mean anything pre-Christian to do with the Celtic peoples and sometimes Northern Europe, which that's a huge topic. Um, mm. If you want to read about the three branches of Druidry and how it was revived, uh, John Michael Greer's book on Druidry, the Handbook of Druidry, is a really good resource and an easy read. John Michael Greer is mm. always very good at just laying out the facts and, you know, not not interpreting a bunch of things. So. I see here he's written a lot of books regarding um, Druidry and Celtic uh, tradition, but combining it with uh, ceremonial magic from Golden Dawn, mm. which looks quite interesting. I haven't yeah. actually gotten around to reading those yet. Yeah, John Michael Greer does have uh, many good practice books and, you know, stuff from his own work also, uh, but he also has good just historical books. Mm. And also, I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, that point when Gardner and, was it Cargon? Who created Ovod? Or, I can't remember now, my history's terrible. Was it Gardner and Cargon? Okay. Philip Cargon. Uh, they were good. I think it was Philip Cargon, and... but I don't think it was Gardner. No, it was. It was. I remember the story of, of Gardner and the they were they basically branched off and Gardner created Wicca, what eventually became Wicca and Cogom Ross Nichols. Ross Nichols. Sorry, Cogom wrote about it. Um Yeah. Yeah. So Ross Nichols then branched off and created the Druidic um branch of what they were studying well, and everything else. Yeah, there was so the, a lot of the ancient Druid order first, and then they kind yeah, of so, yeah. split, and Obod was founded by Philip Cargom, and then, mm. well, Philip Cargom was asked to lead it. And anyways, yeah, Obod has their history on their website. Mm. But I believe a lot of um, because Gardner and and uh, Nichols were so closely entwined and entangled. Um, there's there's a lot of wicker that came across into the druid branch of that that friendship, uh, which I think did branch off quite a bit from the original source. All right, should I continue? Yep. Okay. Are you a member of admission, and do you understand the order of one seven three four? A somewhat rude question. But since I cannot ask the traditional questions in writing, I have to ask somewhat impolite questions. Interesting short little paragraph that member of admission would be someone who was initiated into uh, coven, clan, etc., etc. Yeah, into some form of what we now call traditional witchcraft. I, mm. I don't know if back then that was really the term that was used. Uh, just like member of admission uh, but yeah I, I like that he's like sorry it's rude to just straight out ask you <laughs> have you been initiated <laughs> uh, that's how we would say that these days but mm -hmm. you know what's he gonna do it's letter writing no. and do you understand the order of 1734 we're not gonna get into that now because that gets unraveled through the letters, mm -hmm. but we'll discuss it as we go. Um, where am I? I understand from the family that there was at one time quite a considerable influx of the faith into America in settlements in the Midwest. The symbols used by the state of Texas point towards this being a fact. Some of the neo-pagan neo traditions of the hill folk also point towards a considerable belief in the religion of the three mothers, Kansas being one of the states in which this appears. The horsemen, of which my father was a member, appears to have settled in force in the cattle and sheep areas, 
so it is very possible that the clan system is still present in the Midwest. Seems like a very simple paragraph that, but definitely not. Um, I was actually reading um, some uh, William Gray, and he often alludes to the tools the, or the weapons of the four directions. Um, he, he likes to allude to the cowboy. Mm. Um, so like the sword or the the knife became uh, the dagger and the um, chalice became the drinking, I can't remember what to call it now, a uh, specific name for it. Um, but it, he like he loves to, I've, I've seen it twice now in two different books of this. <clears throat> so I don't think that, um, you know, this was great clans of witches coming over and, and settling the Midwest and mm. starting the cowboy movement and, and stuff like that. I don't think the big uh, Texas star, which is a pentacle, an upright pentacle in a circle, but it's solid. I don't think that has much to do with witchcraft. I think it's just the fact that these symbols and these tools, very, very common to a wide variety of people because they are sacred symbols in a ton of cultures <clears throat> and they're sort of universal human symbols the same thing for tools if you're going to be out in the bush you need a knife mm. uh, you also need something to drink out of you know rope is very handy these are just the tools of survival and mm. because they are the tools of survival they are also the tools of witchcraft but I don't think that um, neo-pagan traditions or old witchcraft traditions seeded the faith of the United States. Uh, we wouldn't be in the pickle we're in now if that were the case. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is mystery to be had in the idea that those sacred lineages and those threads of sacred symbolism and knowledge are still threaded deeply within people as they move and determine especially the symbolism that they want to uphold in the founding of their nations and the founding of their states that sort of thing so i can understand it from that point but historically speaking you know it's just sometimes a star is just a star yeah it's it's the same thing of you know which has lasted from the 14th century in an unbroken line passing secret knowledge underground and we're never tainted by the church and that sort of thing it's just mm. that's not the way culture and humans and migration and everything works you know it's a romantic notion and it has some mysteries hidden within it but it's it's highly unlikely that it factually happened that way. Yeah, I mean, when I was a little kid, we used to get a silver star or a gold star on our forehead if we did good. Imagine a kid going home and parents going crazy. You've got a pentagram on your forehead. <laughs> no, it's just a freaking star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I uh, remember they gave out gold stars when we were in kindergarten, and not necessarily on our forehead, we just got stickers. And mm. I remember when they stopped that because some parents complained that it was devil worship in the schools. Oh, my word. Okay. I was just joking. <laughs> no, that happened when I was in kindergarten. We weren't allowed to no, draw no. stars in the dirt outside at recess and all sorts of stuff. Mm. The world has gone insane. Well, it's been insane for a while. Yeah. And, All right, I'm okay. But also, people aren't monolithic, you know? Mm. Uh, groups migrate, everybody's different, family traditions are different. Even a whole town of people that all go to a singular church under a singular minister or abbot or whatever they're called, they're all going to have slightly different beliefs and practices anyways. So mm. that's not to say that there wasn't a member of the family that didn't end up in Kansas and passed on the religion of the three mothers and, and that sort of thing, but not as a 
as a whole movement and a nation founding movement. Mm. That was Puritans. Yeah, I was, I was, that's what I was thinking of. I was trying to, the Puritans. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, let me carry on. I appear to have asked many questions and given you no information about myself. I am male, married, a member of the people of two admissions and aged 35. I know the right and left hand language, the story of the flood and of the child that survived. I have seen one become seven and seven one. World without motion. What, sorry, let me say that again. World, not world, world without <laughs> motion between three elements. As Guion said, and I'm, and I'm still learning how many beans make five and the number of steps in a ladder. I come from the country of the oak, the ash, and the thorn. I am against the present form of gardenerism and all kindred movements, although, like Taliesin, I believe they could become something far greater. Uh, let me just finish there. My religious beliefs are found in an ancient song, Green Grow the Rushes O, and I am an admirer and a critic of Robert Graves. Flags, flax, and fodder. Signed Robert Crockery. And that little symbol at the bottom there is now the the glyph of the 1734 tradition. Yeah, so let's look back over at the the facsimile yeah, here. And there's quite a bit in that last one, but this all get this all, this all gets taken to pieces in the uh, next letters. So should we? So you can see here where Cochrane signs it. He does draw that glyph, mm. which I, I I see as means one seven three four. Yeah. Well, we find we find out it is. Yep. Indeed. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there in that last paragraph where he talks about himself. Um, I know the right and left hand language. He's alluding to, I think, the tree language that is in Robert Graves. Um, Graves. And the story of the floods in there as far as I remember as well. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's a lot of this in the White Goddess, mm -hmm. which is why which, we're which reading it. <laughs> yes, we're doing a study of it on the Discord server. If you would like to join us, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right. And then he Here he starts to explain one seven three four when he says, "I've seen one become seven mm. and seven one. and then still learning how many beans make five. So you know, being a bit humble. Not saying he's a know-it-all. And the number of steps in a ladder. And how many beans make five? Now, I'm not English, but from what I understand, that's still a common saying. Well, maybe not now. Not now that the millennials have come along and don't use such language anymore. But not a witchcraft saying, just a folk saying. For, uh, mm. you know, having it all together. Understanding basic things. But also that phrase is in Taliesin's poems. Two in the hand and one well, in the I, mouth kind of thing. Like Jack and the Beanstalk. Yeah. Hmm. So that's that's where I learned it from anyway. More folk tales and history and stuff there. Hmm. Alright, should we go on to the next letter? A lot of this gets taken apart in the other letters as I said, so this is just the introduction really. Yep. So we'll go into the next. Can I go and make a cup of coffee? Because my coffee's finished. <laughs> yeah. Well, if anybody has any questions or thoughts or anything, please put them in the any chat. Comments? Say hi. Yeah. Let us know you're there. Uh, and then when we come back, we will get into the second letter. Yes. All right. So we'll see you just now. If you haven't, just have a look at the links in the description. Okay.
Welcome back. This is Black Hat Chat, and we are doing the Croconettas, the ones to Joseph Beowulf Wilson. I said it first time right. <laughs> All right, so we have discussed the first letter. We are now going to have a look at the second letter, which was written or sent on the 12th night of 1966. <laughs> Dear Mr. Wilson, many thanks for your letter which I read with great interest. Uh, you obviously have a deep interest for the faith, and I will attempt to explain something of it to you. This will be a difficult task, since talking about the people we describe ourselves as such is a matter that every hereditary group trains out of its members. The religion is also more mystical than most, so words are very poor approximations of what we actually discover or feel about our beliefs. There's that thing again of um, uh, not calling yourselves witches. Well, or every the people, every group of people, calls themselves the people until mm. they have to encounter another group that demands a name for them. Uh, and this is something we see a lot of times uh, as we watch colonialism move across the globe and that sort of thing that we end up calling various cultures and peoples whatever their native language says is people. And then we mm. borrow that foreign word and use that as the name. So, you know, I'm not surprised to find that a traditional witchcraft practice is just called the people. That's, that's what groups do. Yep. It's a logical thing. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat tonight. <clears> throat> All right. A driving thirst for knowledge is the forerunner of wisdom. Knowledge is a state that all organic life possesses. Wisdom is the reward of the spirit gained in the search for knowledge. Truth is variable. What is true now will not be true tomorrow, since the temporal truths are dependent upon ethics and social mores. Therefore, wisdom is possibly eternal truth untouched by man's condition. So we come so we come to the heart of the people, a belief that is based upon eternity and not upon social needs or pressures. The which belief then is concerned with wisdom. Our true name then is the wise people, and wisdom is our aim. We're carrying on. Well, these are some good things to keep in mind. Um, these definitions of words as we read more of Cochrane's work as we go back and examine his articles uh, where he talks about the truth of witchcraft is revealed. This is how he's using these very important words, wisdom and knowledge and truth, and what the differences are between them. So he's setting up all of those basics so that we can understand what he's talking about. I think it is good to define between temporal truth and eternal truth as well. Mm -hmm. And he's he he views truth as variable because mm. they're dependent upon ethics and social mores. So what is true today is not what is true in 1960, is not what is true in 1860, and so on and so forth, because those social mores change. Those ethics change. They're dependent upon society. Yeah, well, they are. It also differs from person to person as well. One person's truth is not another person's truth. <clears throat> All right. Uh, some groups seek fulfillment in mystic experience. This is correct if one does not forget the duty of involvement, the prime duty of the wise. It is not enough to see the lady. It is better to serve her and her will by being involved in, in humanity and the process of fate. The single name of all gods is fate. In fate and the overcoming of fate is the true grow. For from this inspiration comes and death is defeated. There is no fate so terrible that it cannot be overcome, whether by a literal victory gained by action and in time, or the deeper victory of spirit in the lonely battle of the self. Fate is the trial, the castle perilous, in which we all meet to win or to die. Therefore, the people are concerned with fate, for humanity is greater than the gods. 
although not as great as the goddess. When man triumphs, fate stops and the gods are defeated. So you, so you, so you understand the meaning of magic now. Magic and religion are aids to overcome fate, and fate is a cradle that rocks the infant spirit. We spoke about uh, overcoming fate in our fate versus free will um, live chat, as far as I remember. Yeah, but we weren't using fate quite in the same sense. And, mm. and that's something that gets hung up a lot and why it's important to listen to the definitions of the author as they describe things. We were using fate when we talked about fate and free will as predestination. Mm. And here... Not as, not as fate as a goddess. Right. Here fate is the gods. And being involved with humanity is the responsibility he calls it the prime duty of the wise so it's not a removal from humanity it's not an extrication from society involvement is required mm. and while we serve the goddess old dame fate the goal is overcoming of fate so magic and religion are, are processes are um tools to use in that process of overcoming fate because overcoming fate is um, to stop that predestination to stop that that rolling cycle of reincarnation of mortal life um, but fate is the cradle that rocks the infant spirit that cannot be done without participation in humanity because that is is the cradle through which spirit incarnates and experiences the process that allows one to overcome fate. <laughs> See, all of that reminds me of Buddhism. Yeah, and, and I'm using I'm using a lot of Buddhist language there mm. because it's the I don't know that's the foil to a lot of witchcraft. Um, we talk about the cycle of reincarnation, you know, getting off the wheel of the cycle, achieving nirvana, getting out of samsara, that sort of thing. And that's not the goal of witchcraft or mm. the religion of witchcraft, because here Cochrane is mostly talking about religion. He's talking about magic a little bit too, but this religious practice, that is not the goal. The goal is to overcome death overcome fate overcome that physical process but it is through the participation in that 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 happens mm. i think we'll have to talk about that more at some stage it's, it is one of those topics that is very difficult to actually explain or even put into words why it it sounds confusing it's really you know the truth is, is simple and seen and hidden in plain sight we have all these riddles and all these mm. phrases that go around this idea because once you grasp it well it's very simple and it makes sense but until you can piece those bits together in your head it just sounds super confusing mm. <laughs> because it's it's all this big interconnected wibbly wobbly timey wimey mess when we try to put it into words it's not linear it's not mm. you know a perfectly linear process because this is religion not logic and if, i was going to say i think that whole paragraph it would actually be a good idea to um go and study buddhism um just to you know get the get that explanation from a different perspective to try and understand that because it is i mean um a lot of people talk about you you, you know becoming enlightened and that's the mm -hmm. ultimate goal but if you actually delve into Buddhism itself, it's actually about serving the community. Um, so all of that, mm -hmm. as I say, just reminds me of Buddhism, everything there. Well, I mean, the goals are very similar and the methods are very similar, but I always think of um, many of the paths of Buddhism, the goal is out. And many of the paths mm. of witchcraft, the goal is in. Mm. 
But they're going to the same place. Mm. Yeah. It's just the whole, as I say, the whole idea of um, people consider Buddhism to be this whole, you need to become enlightened, which is that out process. But I've read a lot of things in Buddhism that is about the inward. Um, it is about serving the community and mm-hmm. um, it's more about them than it is about you. Right. You know, that type of thing. So it kind of reverses that whole process that is commonly understood as yeah. being Buddhism. Yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, here we are back at many paths up the mountain. Um, mm. People do people things in people ways. And, you know, we're we're all seeking enlightenment, nirvana, joy, union, um, Hagia Sophia. Uh, you know, however you want to put it, we're all Just seeking that. Ways. And and the path there is different in every tradition. That's that's why we call them paths. Um, mm-hmm. And most of them are paths and traditions because they're repeatable. You can pass mm-hmm. them on to someone else and and get the same results. You can repeat and be successful. Yeah. Just don't confine yourself to the ideology of one part. Well, you can. You can. Because if it works, it works. But it's not the only path. There's others that work just as well. Well, I think when you're first learning a new path or tradition, you really need to focus on it and learn the whole mm. thing. you got to examine the entire ball of wax, you know, and go through everything. And then once you've got that, then it's very important to compare and contrast with other systems, which means you're going to have to study another tradition in isolation and learn the whole ball of wax and then start putting Mm -hmm. them together. And if you want to learn a tradition well, you're going to need to do that repeatedly. So yes, better a jack of many trades than a master of none. But Mm -hmm without understanding the context of the total story, the complete worldview, then you're not getting there. That's the master of none part. You're not understanding it. Yeah. You're just picking up bits and pieces. You're not really understanding the, the place of the piece and therefore you cannot compare it to the place of a similar piece in another tradition. Mm. All right, let me carry on. I'm not sure if I read uh, Now You Know What Witches Are. Um, You are confusing Lay, L-A-Y, a story told to music with Lay, L-E-Y, which means in Celtic, flat. The lay, Lay paths were drovers' roads used by the Neolithic herdsmen to drive sheep and other cattle. They were designed to go from one part of the country one part of a country to another in an absolutely straight line. If you are in, sorry, if you are in what was Indian country, a look along the horizon of hills or plains, you will, sorry, let me let me try, let me start that sentence all over again. If you are in what was Indian country and you look along the horizon of hills or plains, you will sometimes see an artificial nick cut in the plains of plains or hills. If you go to that point, you will notice that that mark corresponds to another within eyesight, and so on until you would have traveled either the whole length of Great Britain or Northern America. Which are very, These very li- different distances. Yeah, extremely <laughs> different. <laughs> yeah. Um, These lay paths are very strongly connected to the religion of the wise since the sheep herders who carved out the hills also made stone circles such as Stonehenge, Avebury, and uh, the Roll Rites, and so on, and likely the great stone medicine wheels found throughout Northern America. So, no. No, no I was going to say, I'm not sure if he's just picking at straws and trying to make comparisons that aren't really there. Yeah, yeah. Um, the cultures that... Uh, the the monolith builders 
we don't know that they were necessarily the people that uh, identified and, and shaped the landscape with ley lines. Um, mm. There's a lot of theory that the peoples who did that were before the megalith cultures. And before the megalith cultures were cultures that were doing the same kinds of buildings out of wood, most likely. So, and, and there's some differences here. Um, especially when we start, start talking about Northern America, as many of the cultures that were present, present in Northern America have values about not leaving a mark on the environment, specifically mm -hmm. not leaving behind traces um, in ways that would last through the centuries. And so, yes, there are the artificial nicks in the hills that he talks about where you can sight ley lines and travel paths they are not necessarily just for shepherds and, and drovers roads uh, they were used for humans most likely as interestingly enough as some cultures moved across the land yes they followed herds they were not um, managing these herds it was not an agricultural thing but they were uh, caring for the environment so you can find uh, food that is available in the wild as you move through those paths and back because they cultivated all of these plants. Mm -hmm. And so to look for artificial and man-made marks in the landscape is a mistake, especially in Northern America because many of the indigenous peoples did purposely did not do that. They purposely were so connected to the land and so integrated in their living with the land that it doesn't look like artificial or man-made marks. Mm. You know, this is the same thing that, that created the idea of predestination when the colonials arrived and saw that there were these beautiful cultivated forests full of food and the land was vibrant and bursting. It wasn't because that's just the way God made it. It's because the indigenous peoples living there had for thousands of years cultivated the land and cared for it, but not in a way that the European settlers, uh, colonizers, could see as man-made because the values were different. So, mm -hmm. um, and there's uh, a speculation that the megalith builders may not have been... Um, practicing uh, shepherding at that time. They may have been more what we would call a hunter-gatherer society. And that the migrations to the sacred sites the, where we now see the megaliths were part of the process. They were not settlements. They were mm. points to go to and from. Uh, but anyways, that's a, a whole other thing. And there's a lot of theories about that. And a lot of theories and a lot of evidence has changed in the last... Yeah. 40 years even. So, you know, Cochrane is not um, being purposely obtuse. He is talking about what was believed at his time. Yeah. So I read, some, read, read something recently about Stonehenge um, that found new evidence that it was probably built a lot earlier than previously thought of. Mm -hmm. So whoever they thought built the Stonehenge it's, it predates it thousands of years. Yeah, and, and shepherding and droving compared to the evolution of humanity are kind of late mm. in the process. So, yeah. And, and we're still, uh, still learning tons and tons of things. Yeah. If I understand the, the lay pass correctly, these are the ley lines that, that lie across uh, the land. And at certain points, they kind of join and then split off. And there's, there's a point there. From point to point is what the, the where these herm, hermy posts are, if I understand correctly. I don't think so. No. The, I don't think the posts mark those points. They're just sites along the road, from my understanding. Um, so it's sim simply standing at one point, seeing how far you could see, and then going to that point, and that's yeah. the next point. They're sighted. They're for traveling. So it depends upon how far you can see, 
which is very, very dependent upon the landscape, elevation, all sorts of stuff. And there was a time where a lot of these ley lines were sighted based upon barrows. And now we don't mm -hmm. think that the barrows were part of the ley line system. They were barrows. But people thought that these hills with the trees just on top of them that look kind of weird in the landscape were part of this sighted ley line system. And they were probably much later in the process that um, this was already a sacred space or this was already a significant point and therefore someone important was buried there because of that existing situation. Now, mm. are the ley lines magically active um, energy lines and therefore that's why people traveled across them? Is it, that's been my understanding. That's, that's what is generally assumed, but we have no way of knowing that. Are they now mm. magically active because people traveled across them? True, yeah. You know, because they have the imprint of the history of thousands of footsteps and heartbeats moving across the land in this way? Was mm. their work done? to make them magically active on purpose so that it would be easier to travel through them. You know, it, we don't know. It's the chicken and the egg. We don't know how that developed. And it is so, so ancient that, I mean, we, we will probably never figure that out. Even cultures mm -hmm. that are still holding on to their indigenous wisdom, this is happening all over the world. And you know, while one culture here or one culture there may have their indigenous wisdom still intact about this process, it doesn't necessarily mean that it transfers to other parts of the world and other cultures. Mm. Yeah. All right, let me carry on here. I think we've got more of that now. Uh, the Herm or Hermy Post is the solitary, solitary altar stone that one often finds upon these ancient roads, and if they are approached correctly, may be used as places to gain whatever you desire by means of prayer and of magic. They are sites of ancient power now nearly forgotten, but still places where more than one world meets. I will see if I can send you some photographs later of such places, since they will help you to find the Amarind equivalent. And there you will find the answers to all your questions. Although the form it will take at, at an Indian site will be somewhat different to how it comes to me. It is at such places that one may see the goddess become seven and then return to one. The seven are hinted at in the days of the week, but consider those days as feminine, not masculine. Yeah, I hope that gets uh, explained later because that did confuse me. I can't remember that. So, from when I originally confused. I think what he's talking about here are the stones that are found all over Britain. Uh, some of them are called cup stones or fairy stones. They're found in various places in Northern Europe too. Um, some of them are natural stone places where people have gone to worship and do magic and and that sort of thing. Some of them are burial markers. Uh, further south into Europe, we find um, the idea of erecting stones along paths as a form of fame marking, not necessarily where someone died or anything like that, just this stone was erected in their memory. Um, and mm. it's in this prominent place where many people will pass by, so their, their name is not forgotten and carried on. We Cochrane says that this is happening in North and South America, and it's probably not. Um, the cultures are different. Uh, the stones are not the same. I've been to many of the stones that would be considered that, but they're put there by people who were from Europe, who are carrying mm -hmm. on those traditions in some way um, in another place. They're not necessarily being erected by um, the Native American cultures. As far as I know, I don't know everything, of course, and I may be wrong. But again, because of 
many of the culture's values of leave no trace that is not a logical uh, progression for the way their culture would interact with the environment. Mm. What are the great stone medicine wheels that you spoke about? There um, have been some very large uh, medicine wheels uh, found, especially in the Southwest where the environment is right that they don't uh, disintegrate or weren't taken back apart. Uh, but I don't think, I don't know. I don't think those are similar to the megaliths in Europe. The fact that they're stone and that they're sacred sites and they're they are culturally and religious important sites, yeah. But that's probably where the similarities end. Mm because they're being created by different cultures with different value systems for different reasons and they are interacted with in different ways. I mean, sacred sites are <clears throat> sacred sites, but then it is how the culture interacts with that, how the people see that, why they built it, why they're uh, coming to those places, why they're, you know, building in the way they are, if they're dismantling the sites or not. You know, I don't think there's sure. there's universal uh, traditional witchcraft moving across the land. Mm. Shall we talk about the seven here, or shall we carry on until it gets taken apart a bit later? Let's carry on, because there's there's yeah. a lot more. Yeah. Uh, da, da, da. Likewise, the order of one seven three four is not a date of an event, but a grouping of numerals that mean something to a witch. One that becomes seven states of wisdom, the goddess of the cauldron. Three that are the queens of the elements, fire belonging alone to man and the blacksmith god. Four that are the queens of the wind, the wind gods. The Jewish orthodoxy believe that whosoever knows the holy and unspeakable name of God has absolute power over the world of form. Very briefly, the name of God spoken as Tetragrammaton I am that I am, breaks down in Hebrew to the letters I-H-V-H, or yod heh vah -he. or the Adam Kadamon, the heavenly man. Adam Kadamon is a composite of all archangels. In other words, a poetic statement of the names of the elements. So what the Jew and the witch believe alike is that the man who discovers the secret of the elements controls the physical world. 1734 is the witch way of saying yod here -he. Yep, so there's what 1734 is. Yep, there you go. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody. I honestly think that's <laughs> fairly straightforward. Um, mm -hmm. There's not... There's not illusions, there's not riddles. There's, there's not much of anything well, hidden right there. Well, I mean, we could take it apart a lot more. I mean, the seven states of wisdom, what are the seven states of wisdom? Goddess of the Cauldron is called Dame Fate. Uh, three that are the queens of the elements, air, air water, and earth. Flax, flax, and man. fodder. Flax, flax, and fodder, yeah. Um, four that are the queens of the wind gods. There are four winds. Yeah, which yeah. have come into other traditions as the watchtowers, you know, mm -hmm. the four winds, the directions, why directions are associated with elements is because of the winds. Um, mm -hmm. Although in traditional witchcraft, the, the elements are something different. They're not the winds. They are earth, air, um, and water, and then fires its own. It's an element, but it's its own thing. Mm. Belongs to man, the yeah. blacksmith god. Yeah, yeah. And then you know, the blacksmith god brought fire to man. And and he mm. breaks it down and compares it to tetragrammaton, uh, yod -he vav -he, which is a, a a very good comparison. You know, uh, I think it it's an easy one to understand, and there's lots of information out there about the tetragrammaton and Adam Kadamon and what that all is and and why that's magically important 
So, mm -hmm. you know, he breaks it down and says, these are very similar. 1734 is the witch way of saying yod heh vav -he. And he's mm -hmm. still putting witch in, in quotation marks at this point because, I mean, you, you don't call it witchcraft at that point. It's not. Mm -hmm. All right. So the language of the hands is complex and I will deal with it much later. The oak, the ash, and the thorn are the names of the three elemental, blah, 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 three elemental mothers. All this is quite a complex philosophy. I will deal with it later. All right, so we'll find that in later letters, so we won't go into that now. Gardnerism is the title to, to the work of the late and unlamented Gerald Gardner. Harry's going to rip by... Gerald Gardner apart. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Prepare, everybody. Um, brace yourselves. Who, driven by a desire to be whipped and to prance around naked, devised his own religion, which he called witchcraft. As you by now have gathered, we do nothing like this. Since the Gardnerians... Oh, yeah, so, since the Gardnerians are very pu publicity conscious, they tend to give us a very bad name and will one day possibly restart the persecution. Hence, they are thoroughly disliked. Yeah, so I, it, it's no secret that Cochran did not get on with Gardner, didn't like what he was doing, mm. didn't like how Gardner was um, practicing witchcraft. Um, I don't know for sure, but I have an inkling that Cochran was the start of Gardner is not a witch because he's perverted kind of idea. Mm. I mean, that's what he just said in this paragraph. Um, so... I know plenty of traditional witches that get on with other traditional witches, British traditional witches, Gardnerians, Wiccans, just fine. Um, mm. But uh, there is definitely some historical animosity there. And uh, it's coming through quite plainly <laughs> in Cochrane's <laughs> letters. Uh, but, you know, everyone is entitled to their opinion. I do not think that gardener's practice is driven by a desire to be whipped and prance around naked mm. um there was definitely an element of naturalism that was involved in the development of gardnerian witchcraft but naturalism was a big thing in england at the time i mean it wasn't it wasn't just gardner he wasn't alone in this there no, okay yeah. Him and Nichols were, were part of the uh, Naturalist Society. There were Naturalist Societies, they were Naturalist Camps, it was considered part of good medicine at the time, mm. you know, so, um, but, you know, these kind of things happens when, when cultures look at, at other cultures and go, we don't do that, that's wrong, that's bad, and I think mm. that's what's happening here. Um, Cochrane's religion, Cochrane's family practice, uh, his people do not do witchcraft like that. And the naturist and the naturalist um, practices that were uh, a big part of a lot of English people's lives at the time, he was not into. And his people were not into. So there was a big division there. And of course, well, there's always the fear of restarting the persecutions. Mm. I do remember reading that Doreen Valiant actually left because she got sick and tired of, it, of him constantly um, carrying on about Gardner. Mm. Mm. So, All right. So, yeah. Mm. yeah. Don't don't take that mm. as anything more than the usual things that Seems come up. Opinion. Yeah. I mean, you know. We're all going to read books or, or find other people's practices where we're going along and then we're like, ew, I would never do that. Why is that in your witchcraft? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's that's what's happening here, right? in my opinion, of course. Mm -hmm. All right, then. Uh, Graves, White Goddess, contains the bread we and win. This will answer many questions if meditated upon. Not only does it speak of the seven worlds, but it also tells you how to get there. 
where the evening star and the dark of night meet is one way. Yeah, here's so some riddles. Know. Riddles. <laughs> yeah. Where the evening star and the dark of night meet, that's twilight. Oops, it's a specific there? twilight. It's the uh, point where Venus is uh, slightly after the setting sun, and you can mark mm. it on the horizon. Uh, the rising of the morning star and the setting of the evening star have been used to mark sacred times in many, many cultures. Um, it's a huge, huge thing in Egyptian magic and mm. much of the Egyptian cultures. And, you know, there's all this stuff about the cycles of Venus. If you watch the Venus cycles play out on a map of the solar system, you will see that it draws a pentagram. That is the, if you plot the retrogrades, and the retrogrades are a big part of the cycle that determines whether it's a morning star rising before the sun or an evening star setting after the sun, because it's always within 60 degrees of the sun, because, you know, it's inside the orbit of the earth. So, you know, that, that relationship to those bigger cycles is a big part of magic, especially throughout Europe and Northern Africa. Mm. Uh, all right, well, we won't read the uh, Predwi and Win because it's, it's, it's an entire manuscript. <coughs> big, big thing. Big, big thing. Yeah, big, uh, big thing. But so, uh, like, Gardner was tapping into the naturalist movement that's happening at the time. Cochran is here tapping into the mythology and poetic movement that Graves is spearheading uh, at this mm. time. And Graves is purposely reinterpreting a lot of finds in light of this um, Celtic um, English view of things. He's um, doing an eclectic thing where he's taking stuff from all over the world and fitting it into this English narrative or this welsh narrative a lot of it is very welsh um mm. so you know and cochran is tapping into that mythos that's moving through yeah. <clears throat> uh all right then green grows the rushes O is an archer song from the middle ages it is somewhat corrupt now from the christian influence but parts of it are still original. One is one and all, and all alone, and evermore shall be so. The stars on the American flag are pentagrams, the steer skull of Texas is another witch sign, as is the star within a circle. Diagonal bars and V-shaped bars are also witch in origin, like triangles, fleur-de-lis, roses, etc. of heraldic tradition. Coats of arms contain many pagan memories. Yes and no. <laughs> well, here's yeah, we've, we've the same thing I said earlier. But this is also um, poetic sight. When mm. you you change your perspective and you look at the world through uh, the poetic sight or through the, the fairy sight, you see mystical stuff everywhere. You see the world speaking to you through these sacred signs. And... Mm. Uh, I think that's what he's talking about here. I mean, something so basic as triangles and diagonal lines, you know, the V-shaped bars and the diagonal bars, he might be talking about, you know, the Hexenkunst, uh, the brick pattern, which is traced back even earlier to Indian traditions of the, the mark of, my brain just went blank. In German, it's Thunor, but well, there was that thread, but it's old. <laughs> it's super old <laughs> and it's super common. I mean, you know, put three sticks together in a way that's not a triangle or a V-shaped bar or diagonal bar, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's going to happen. And and roses. <laughs> that That's pretty common. Anywhere that there yeah. are flowers, roses. Literally. And again... Literally, yeah. Yeah. Of course, some arms have some pagan memories, but now I gotta look that up as as my brain just goes blank. I talked about it, got a whole study on it in one of these pile of books sitting right here next to me. 
Um, right, just give us a couple of hours, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to go through the books. <laughs> um, uh, Green grows rushes Odo is extremely Christian. Um, it's had an extremely Christian influence. Yeah. Thunder marks, um, the witch's foot, uh, the hexes that we know in uh, Pennsylvania Dutch culture, hex signs. Um, mm -hmm. Lots yeah, and lots of terms all for all, all of these. Open. And and you can fall down the uh, amazing rabbit hole with these symbols. And they're, they're right here in all of this witchcraft stuff that he is talking about. But that's mm -hmm. why I talk about they're fairly universal. It Triangles. Triangles are triangles. A six-pointed star. You know, they're, they're fairly universal. You're going to end up mm -hmm. with these in lots and lots of different ways. Shall I read uh, Green Grows Rushes Own? Sure. I think that's an interesting study. I'll sing you 12, O. Oh. Green grow the rushes, O. Oh. There are 12, O. Oh. 12 for the 12 apostles, 11 for the, the 11 who went to heaven, 10 for the 10 commandments, 9 for the 9 bright shiners, 8 for the April rainers, 7 for the 7 stars in the sky, 7 for the, oh, sorry, 6 for the 6 proud walkers, 5 for the symbols at your door, Four for the gospel makers, three, three is the rivals, two, two, the lily white boys, clothed in clothed all in green, oh one is one and all alone, and evermore shall be so. So lots of Christian symbolism in there. Lots of Christian symbolism, but like so many things, you know, we see we see those traditions survive in the culture that they can survive in. Hmm. And we've got and, to look at the um, interpretation as the 12 apostles. Hmm. Um, 11 apostles and the, the 12th one was Judas Iscariot. Then the 10 is the 10 commandments. Uh, the nine by shiners, those refer to the planets. As I remember, all the celestial bodies. And eight for April Rainers. What is that again? It has something to do with Hyades from Greek mythology. Or this may refer to the rains of Noah's flood. Uh, seven stars in the sky. Those are the, the Pleiades. Other options include, include Ursa Major, or the seven traditional planets. Um, the six proud walkers. Six jars of water that Jesus turned into wine at the wedding feast of Cana of, of Galilee. Um, five for the symbols at your door. It was had to do with the mezuzah. From Jewish tradition, all five symbols displayed above doors of houses that would shelter Catholic priests. Uh, four for the gospel makers, those are the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Uh, three rivals, rivals may be a corruption of riders, or rivals or wisers, referring to the three magi of the nativity. Uh, two lily white boys uh, refers to John the Baptist and Jesus and Jesus so yeah, yeah. it's it's one of those counting songs that has um, a bunch of mystical tradition in it that's old and has probably been rewritten several times or adjusted I mean, mm. one of my favorite pastimes is making filks of, of popular songs and putting all sorts of, you know, 
funny mystery in them because it's fun. And uh, I can't be the only human that's wanted to do that throughout the centuries. That's for mm. sure. Or just hearing something and not quite knowing the words and then adjusting the words to that new meaning to something that makes sense. I mean, you know, uh, the most famous I can think of is Jimi Hendrix and excuse me while I kiss this guy. That's not what Hendrix <laughs> said, but that's what a lot of people think he said. And then they reinterpreted, uh, reinterpreted the song to, to go with that new meaning. And I've even had arguments with people that they're like, no, Hendrix was pro gay rights. That's what that was. And I'm just like, <laughs> honey, no liner notes, but you know, <laughs> Stuff like that happens. <laughs> Things morph and change. Mm -hmm. um, Christopher says the sub-Saharan traditions are for some reason more centered around the moon. Yeah, as we're talking about uh, the movements of Venus, I don't know if it's because of the uh, inf placement around the equator and uh, the fact that Venus is not as prominent as a morning and evening star. I know in Egypt, uh, the movements of Venus also coincided with the flooding of the Nile, which, you know, is the sustainer of life in that area. So that would be a, a very, very significant marker. And if there's not something to coordinate with that, well, the moon is a much bigger influence and a much bigger marker and uh, definitely has influence on tides and, and other, you know, earthly phenomenon, I guess is the way to put that. So. All right, shall I finish letter? <clears throat> yes, yes, yes. Um, the man I work with is called John Armstrong, and he is an actual descendant of the Armstrongs of Cumberland and Durham. Armstrong was not only a bandit, but also a chieftain of no small merit. My regards to yourself, wife and children, flags, flags, fodder, and he puts in brackets, I bless thee by water, by air, and by earth. And then there's a bit of an illustration of where he breaks down the glyph of 1734 into three, uh, three arms and then four arms. Oh, and says, this breaks down into seven, work out what it means. Go back to the facsimile so you can see where he writes that out after his signature and this picks up right here this is the next letter so he's just this breaks down into seven and he's got the three and the cross work out what it means as he points to the glyph he uses to sign his letter mm. and that's why it's uh, important to read both of these and look at both of them yeah, and just in case it's not clear, flags, flax, fodder uh, refers to water, air, and earth. Mm -hmm. Flags are uh, irises, or um, there goes my brain again. Something that starts with a C, the witch's coin. Hold on, hold on. Brain. Please hold. <laughs> not going to get anything out of googling the witch's coin nope just explain it a lot later as well yeah I can't remember the name of the herb but it's a root a root mm. uh, that grows um, along the the banks in the marshy area and can sometimes clog up waterways and, and that sort of thing um, but like mm. orris root, several calamus, calamus. Okay, thank you, brain, for catching oh, up. There we go. Um, but they're called flags because when they bloom, they wave in the wind like beautiful flags, and so they represent water. Flax is linen, and uh, it's related to the air, the airy linen and the fibers and those beautiful little blue, sky blue flowers. And fodder is, of course, the earth, the plants that are 
uh, turned up and, and feed the earth and feed the animals and, and that sort of thing. So they're all plants. They're all referring to flowers, but they're um, the keys to the queens, uh, the keys to the queens of the elements and the blessings of those elements made manifest into the world through the, the offering of the flowers, which is how we know they're feminine and they are from the queens of the elements. Mm -hmm. that, that diagram where he splits the glyph into four and three, actually, all I keep coming back to is uh, the crossroads of four and the crossroads of three. Um, so the crossroads of the god leading into the crossroads of the goddess, which then branches off into the three, three roads. There's no god in there. I know, but I just that's what I keep seeing. And there is a reason three's on top and not off to one side or down on the bottom or in the middle. Are you going to tell us? Nope. No? Okay. <laughs> so that's the thing about talking about all of this stuff. Um, Wilson especially uh, talked a lot about riddles and the riddles in the craft and why they're important. And it's not to hold mysteries, and it's not to keep secrets. It's because the discovery of the riddle is the mystery itself. And to just bleh, and tell you is to take that mystery away from you. And that's not nice. Mm -hmm. You know, working out the riddle and finding that epiphany is very important to the process of witchcraft. And Cochran they're everywhere in his writings. And I don't think he's trying to be obtuse. He's not trying to be more mysterious than thou and all that sort of stuff. And we've talked about this when we talked about initiation. And part of the process, my experience of initiation in traditional witchcraft, it's a gradual thing. It's kenning more and more and more of these riddles until the sight shifts and you can see with that poetic sight and understand these things. And you won't get there if someone just tells you the answer. In mm. fact, it will block the road. So, you know, while we're studying this and, and we're talking about many of these things, you might notice that there's some things that we just kind of skip over and we don't say anything about. Um, because I think it's something you should discover on your own. You should have that opportunity to find mm. those things and help learn to shift into that poetic sight and learn to see through that mythic lens. So, you know, there's things we can talk about and there's things that we, we don't want to spoil it for you. And too many spoilers can thwart the growth. It can kill the flower. So um, I don't think it's actually useful to spoil many of them. It's useful to point the way and be like, look at that. Look at that. That's good. But to say, look mm -hmm. at that, that's what it is. That's not helpful. Mm -hmm. And open the door and kick you through. Yeah. yeah. And we're not necessarily going to come to the same conclusions because it's not about the right answer. It's about the opening. It's about the seeing. I mean, you may come back later and circle around and find out, oh, that's not what that was. You know, I, I thought maze was maze. Um, and and the maze led me down a different maze about different things, and I learned some stuff, so that was useful to me. But then when I went back and read it, it wasn't maze. It was maze. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's stuff like that that happens, too. Sorry, everybody, I had the screen over the chat here, so I didn't see any of it. <laughs> hello, Lady Capella. Hello, Mother of Many. Uh, to catch up. Hello, Emma Rose. Glad you could join us for a little bit. And, and Chris, how are you doing? I haven't seen him for a while, have we? <sighs> right. Okay, we are not going to carry on to the next letter until next week. Yep. So, so think about these things, um, ponder them, dream on them, 
research, look things up, learn as much as you can, figure stuff out, and please feel free to come to our Discord or our Facebook group and talk about it. Uh, mm. You never know what other people might have found. Um, and again, it's, it's not about the right answers. You don't necessarily want to answer the riddle for other people, especially if you feel it has become a key, but you can still discuss it in much the ways we're doing. We're still looking at things. We're still finding things. We're still uh, looking at lenses. And like, I look at things through the lens of an herbalist and a forager because that's a big part of my path. You know, I'm, I'm always working with plants. I'm always digging in the dirt. That's my thing. So that plant language is important to me and is a way I understand things. If that's not your mystery, if that's not your guild, then look at it through another way. And you will still find the same mysteries there. And mm -hmm. bring it up and talk about it because somebody else is going to be looking at it that way. And join us for our book club. <laughs> yep. Where we are working our way through the White Goddess. We're currently doing the first two chapters. So um, you can jump in and join us. We've still got three more days, I think, um, on the first two chapters. And they're, they're short, long. And it's a big, long, confusing book. But don't worry. We will work our way through and find all of the things and dig into all of the things. And it's just um, we're doing it through our Discord not through our Facebook, so you do need to join our Discord server to participate in the book club. But it's just an ongoing text chat, so you don't have to make any specific time. Um, you don't have to make like a, a live or a video call. You can just participate when you can, because we're all around the world and we're all sleeping at different times <laughs> and reading at different times. So just jump in and join us with what you think. It doesn't have to be perfectly well-formed opinions it can just be a whole list of questions because <laughs> that's really helpful too things mm -hmm. we might assume uh that something is corn and and it's not you know although <laughs> there's wheat later that's not wheat in the book so <laughs> it's not it's not corn it's a labyrinth right <laughs> wrong maze <laughs> <laughs> all right then so we are going to go, and Christopher, we need to see you here more often. Thank you very much. Hey. <laughs> and we need to see you on the Discord server as well. Yep. And if you haven't, please hit that like button down there. Uh, I know mm -hmm. when I'm watching lives or YouTube videos, I forget sometimes that I need to do that because I'm just into the video. Uh, but it really That's helps. Terrible. It really helps. Yeah. So uh, hit that thumbs up for us. Um, it, it would help us a lot. And Lord of Many said, thank you both. It's our pleasure. Yes, thank you. Hopefully, we will see you all next week for more letters of from Cochrane. Yep. All right, then. So, good night, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, everybody. Bye. I'm going to bed now. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>